raise on um, constitutional amendment, constitutional resolution CSR 12. And I'm also pleased to be able to announce, um, along with Senate, Senate President Bragdon, that we've reached an agreement with Governor Lynch on the language of a constitutional amendment to address the New Hampshire Supreme Court, Claremont, and Londonderry decisions. And I believe we've passed out the language of that amendment. And uh, the first thing I want to note for you as you look at that language is that it is straightforward and unambiguous. This amendment places a responsibility on the state to maintain a system of public, elementary, and secondary education. It also restores legislative discretion and flexibility with respect to public education that was lost in the Claremont and Londonderry line of decisions. In the Claremont II decision, which was issued nearly 15 years ago now, the New Hampshire Supreme Court held that a legislature is required to maintain a state curriculum based upon a 1989 decision of the Supreme Court of Kentucky. This amendment overturns that aspect of the Claremont and Londonderry decisions. While the state will and should and always has had the responsibility to maintain minimum education standards, these standards will no longer be reviewed under this amendment by use of a strict scrutiny standard of review, which truly should not be the standard of review for legislative policy decisions, but rather the standard of review will be reasonableness, rational basis. Anyone going to court to challenge the public standards established by the legislature will carry the heavy burden of proving that those standards are unreasonable, that the, they aren't rational. This is a vast improvement over the Claremont and Londonderry decisions. As a practical matter, this will mean that the legislature will treat education funding along with an entire spectrum of very important funding and priorities across the state such as transportation, law enforcement, and social services. I mentioned earlier that the language is, uh, for the constitutional amendment is unambiguous and straightforward. Let me quote some of that language. The legislature will have, quote, full power and authority to determine the amount of and the methods of raising and distributing state funding for public education. This language makes clear that the elected legislature and not the courts has the authority to identify which community should receive financial support from the state, and the authority to determine how much support each such community should receive. This is a much more sensible standard than under Claremont, in which the state was required to send money or precious education dollars to communities that just did not need that support. So this amendment will allow us to move past the Claremont and London various decisions and put a, in place a system of excellent public education that is available for all children and allow, by allowing the state to target aid to communities that most need the state's support. I want to make two additional um, points. The first is that this amendment allows school districts to once again play a meaningful role in setting education policy. This is a significant improvement over Claremont, which moved away from New Hampshire's long tradition of a partnership between the state and local school districts with respect to public education. The second point I want to make is that this amendment allows the legislature the discretion to provide for charter schools, homeschooling, and school choice as components of the system of public education and secondary education for our children. So over the next six days, we now must work to find 237 House members who will support this important amendment that will help our state move forward. It's time for our members to work together for the good of the state to give the voters an opportunity to weigh in on this important issue for the future of New Hampshire. The time has arrived, we are so fortunate that it's arrived, to put the Claremont and Londonderry decisions behind us and to get on with providing the best education for our children. Thank you. Uh, Senator Bradley, uh, I think, also has some comments to make. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Bragdon, Speaker O'Brien, uh, friends that are here at this table. Uh, I think first I'd like to comment on the historic nature of um, this agreement that we have, not only um, the support of Governor Lynch, which is absolutely essential for success in November, but I think 
it's particularly meaningful for uh, Representative Hess, myself, and Senator D'Alessandro, who are all on the first committee of conference that um, dealt with this Claremont ruling um, in 1999. And I think um, for the three of us, this is finally a day come true, a day that really involves the best of New Hampshire. The leadership um, that the House has shown for the first time in actually passing a constitutional amendment. Uh, Representative Pass and I remember uh, many times beating our head against the wall um, to get to 200 votes. And under the leadership of Speaker O'Brien and the rest of the conferees and um, House members, Deputy Speaker Tucker, Majority Leader Silva, I'm looking forward to, you know, just as I was looking forward to that big number of 1144, I'm looking forward to the big number of 237. And, and it's because of the historic nature and so much of the New Hampshire advantage um, being part of um, how we educate kids, how we ensure local control, what the state's appropriate responsibility has been. It's taken a huge amount of work, hard work, cooperation, bipartisan work uh, between the House, the Senate, and the Governor. Um, and you can't have good policy uh, unless um, you bring all of those elements to bear. And I think, you know, let me just touch on some of the things that Speaker O'Brien touched on from the Senate's point of view. We're, um, we're very pleased that uh, the word responsibility uh, is in this uh, constitutional amendment as the state has been in the business of setting standards um, for public education for many, many years, and that will continue. And it will allow, um, as I think we wanted to allow um, in 1998, targeted education aid, this will allow it. It will allow local communities and school districts um, to adopt additional elementary and secondary standards and accountability measures as they determine um, appropriate, as long as it's not inconsistent with state education policy. It places upon the state the responsibility to mitigate. That's a large responsibility, one that I think this legislature has taken seriously since the Claremont decision and will continue to take seriously um, with passage of this amendment. But it's going to allow us to be rational in how we target education. Senator Delisandro, you were um, eloquent on the radio this morning talking about North Stratford. It's going to allow um, rational decisions to be made in targeting education. It's also going to return to a standard of reasonableness in how the court um, looks at all of these issues and quite frankly says that um, it will not have the strict scrutiny of assuming that anything that happens in this building is unreasonable. It's high time that um, we have a reasonableness test of the court. The legislature, as I think I've touched on, will have the ability to determine the amount and the methods of raising and distributing the state funding for education, elementary and secondary. I think, again, Senator D'Alessandro did a great job of outlining um, why that's important on the radio this morning. And it ensures that state and local communities work together to implement the best education policy, something um, Speaker O'Brien touched on um, in his remarks for those elementary and secondary education students. So I think what we have here is a tremendous opportunity to move forward to protect the New Hampshire advantage, to allow us the best opportunity for students to thrive, to end things that have come as a result of the um, Claremont decision. I see Ms. Remick in the audience, the statewide property tax being from the Lakes region. Uh, that's important to me. It's going to allow us to protect the New Hampshire advantage as well. Um, this is truly a New Hampshire um, effort of bipartisan cooperation. We can, I believe, pass it from this building, and then it will be our responsibility, each and every one of us, and the governor, and all of the supporters of this, to go out throughout the um, campaign season and talk to fellow voters fellow New Hampshire citizens about how important this is. But today, this is a terrific start, and uh, I just can't say, having been at this issue for quite a while, despite my six-year interlude, uh, <laughs> for me personally, and I think I probably speak for uh, Representative Hess and D'Alessandro, who have been at this a long time, this is a major accomplishment. Thank you.
Thank you, Senator Bradley. Um, and I know there are other prepared remarks that people have read. Thank you, Senator President. Um, it's been an honor to work with this group of people. I would like to thank the Senate side for their cooperation, their hard work on the House side. Representative Hess has been after this, I think, longer than I've been alive. But we've had work not that, that has, not that hard, <laughs> work on this that has finally come to fruition. When we started, as you know, the House had passed language that the Senate rejected, the Senate, we didn't like the Senate language. We have worked very hard to reach collaboration. It was very important to all of us that Governor Lynch also be able to join us because that's been one of his goals. It was important to me that we come out with a statement that says we are maintaining a system of public and elementary education. I believe in our educational system, and I know every time we've worked on a constitutional amendment, people immediately throw up their hands and say, oh, you don't plan to pay for, for education. That's not true. It was also important to me that we keep those options alive that Speaker O'Brien spoke to, to, charter schools, homeschooling. But the third option that we've also maintained is the right for the public schools at the local level to adopt standards and curriculum that are not inconsistent with state frameworks, which what they're now called, they're going to core curriculum. But whatever it is, we have state frameworks. We will say you have to have four years of English to graduate, but it's important at the local level that the schools be allowed to adopt courses that meet their needs under that, and this still manages to do that. So those are the areas that I think we all were working on. And again, I cannot thank the team who came to the table enough and everybody who's worked on this and the governor who is not with us. I will say that Representative Michael Balboni reviewed the language yesterday. He had, he's been sitting at the table with us. He had an appointment that could not be changed this morning. He will be up this afternoon to sign off on the language. He regrets that he cannot be here, but it is what it is. We just worked as hard as we can, and we know we all have busy schedules. So thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. And I believe that concludes the prepared remarks. I would like to thank the Speaker uh, and the Governor uh, for working very hard at this um, uh, with myself and uh, together amongst themselves. Uh, it's been a process of the three different, uh, two different branches of government and two different houses within one branch uh, working together to try to get an arraignment. Um, I think at this point we'll uh, be available for questions. Shy group today. Could someone, but could someone explain to me how this language reduces the legal burden in court on any lawsuit for education funding? How does it accomplish that? How do we go from strict scrutiny to rational with this language? <laughs> by the language stating that if the legislature has the full power and authority, that establishes a rational basis review rather than strict scrutiny review that the state of labor under now for over 15 years. And, and the, the language about uh, the legislature shall have the responsibility to maintain a system of public and secondary education uh, Representative Over seemed to indicate that that meant maintaining the system, but I mean, is is ACE? I mean, that could be. What, what could that could that be any? You know, what what qualifies a system? What what qualifies a system is one that meets the foundational standards that this table established. Um, it, it is a system that we can look at and say this town is meeting the um, foundational standards for providing a, a uh, uh, an elementary or secondary education for the children. Right now, if you look at NHDOE, they do list all of those frameworks and those standards, and that is open to the public, and the schools do work on it. But I mean, we're, so we're talking about the minimum standards, or are we talking about something different? We're, we're talking about New Hampshire history. Um, since the beginning of, of our, our state, there's always been a recognition that the state has a responsibility to ensure that um, the uh, authority is, and, and discretion that's given to the towns is being exercise in a way that ensures that each of the children in these towns will, will have at least a foundation of uh, uh, standards in address for their education. You know, and, and some of the first bills passed by this legislature were intended to address this back you know, 200 years ago. We're, we're returning to that to ensure 
that um, our children have a good education. Um, but we're also returning to what has been um, a, 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 a strong aspect, a very successful aspect of, uh, uh, of our history, which is the partnership between the local school districts and local towns and, and cities and the state in, in getting the best education out to our children. And I would just add, um, Josh, that the state has been in the business of setting minimum standards uh, for high schools since the mid-1960s and for elementary schools, uh, I think about 10 years later. So um, this is consistent with the long-term history of what's happened in the state of New Hampshire. Well, so Senator, you said something to the effect of that, that you hope that this will, uh, that, the, that the court's offer presumption has been that anything emerges from this building is, is unreasonable. I mean, do you, That's do you, what the strict scrutiny means, that uh, there's a presumption that the state has the burden to prove reasonableness, so there's a presumption that it's unreasonable. Uh, virtually all other laws that come out of this building are judged to be reasonable at first blush by the court, and we believe um, an issue as important as this, that the reasonableness test, the so-called rational basis test, should be the standard by which the court would judge. Okay, so you were talking about the here. level of judicial review. You weren't <clears throat> suggesting that they think that any school funding thing that comes out of here is unreasonable in a non-legal, you know, in a non-legal sense. I mean, I'm just trying to get a sense of to, to what degree. I mean, you don't believe that the court has sort of acted in an antagonistic <clears throat> manner. Uh, I'm just commenting on this language and what this language will involve moving forward in the future should uh, the voters choose to enact it. That it will return uh, that reasonableness test to any um, court proceedings that might involve education funding in the future. The, the difference, Josh, as well as the strict scrutiny analysis puts the court in the position of, of determining whether uh, the choice made by the legislature is the best means available to meet a um, legitimate state interest. Once the court asks that question, they're basically substituting their policy choice for the legislature's, uh, legislature's policy choice because best to them might be different than the best to the legislature. Rational basis is an analysis that says, um, is there a legitimate state interest? Obviously there is here. Um, is this a rational way of addressing that, that uh, state interest? Um, an entirely different uh, level of view. And the, the, I'm sorry to figure over what the language precisely is what that, that gives, that, that makes this clear to, the, to this court and future courts that that is the standard of the legislature's and Again, where it says the legislature shall have the full uh, power and authority to um, determine the amount of and the methods of raising and distributing funding, what Dan it allows us to do is to really address those communities that need all of our assistance. What we all want to do is to make sure that those communities that are truly having difficulty educating their children because they're either property poor or ch children rich and they need our assistance, that we can do that. Rather than trying to uh, uh, spread money across the state and not be able to help out the communities that, that need it the best. You know, what this is going to do is allow us to move beyond this period of spreadsheet litigation when it comes to um, education funding, um, which drives spreadsheet legislation, and rather move to one where we're going to be able to say, we want to make sure even the children in, in towns that are having difficulty educating them are going to get a good education because the state will be there. Does anybody up there believe that this uh, constitutional amendment, if it ultimately is passed by the public, will result in decreasing how much money is currently being spent on education? Absolutely not. And, and I think if I can add to um, what Speaker O'Brien <clears throat> just said, you know, when we started putting together a budget, and unfortunately, um, Chairman Weiler and Chairman Morris aren't here, one of the things that was really adamantly uh, adhered to by both the House and the Senate was that we were not going to reduce, even in spite of the, it was nearly an $800 million budget deficit that we inherited, we were not going to reduce funding um, to local um, communities for education. So I think 
if we can manage to make and keep that commitment in one of the toughest budget situations that New Hampshire's ever faced, I, I think the voters of this state can depend on um, people that believe it's our role and our responsibility uh, to make sure that every child has an opportunity uh, for a, a good education, an excellent education, uh, that future legislatures that may not involve any of us except um, you know, our, our state's person in the Senate who is going to outlive us all, um, Senator D'Alessandro, this legislature and future legislatures will meet that responsibility. Mr. Speaker, I think you know what I, I think that might have to do it for today because the conferees do need to get across the hall. They were supposed to start at ten, so maybe just one more quick one, and then we have to. Everyone can just move if, right if across the hall to actually get to work. If I'm a resident of the area, the London area, or even why do I vote? Because you you'll realize that you can go to your legislature and say we're having difficulty educating our children because we have so many of them, and as we spread the money around, it's not available. Can we sit down with you and talk about that as we talk about a lot of important needs that we have in our community? And let's work out the assistance that we need. You will be talking to legislators who will be able to target aid and, and assist communities that make that argument and will be able to do it on a rational basis rather than sitting back saying we better make sure that we meet a, um, s an impossible standard of trying to spread money across the state in a way that is going to please the court that we won't even be able to figure out what its policy decision is going to be until the litigation arises. And I think if I might add to that, Gary, I, I think as we've seen the spreadsheets year after year after year after year um, with some towns um, that we all know, every one of us at this table, and quite frankly, every one of you in the room know, need more help but actually either losing money or just barely remaining in place and, and not getting the assistance they need while other communities that rationally, how can you justify uh, the millions of dollars um, going to those communities? I think we're gonna be able to have that conversation with folks in all 234 communities, including Derry um, and Nashua, as you said. And the other thing that I think people will realize is that this constitutional amendment, confronting one of the largest issues that the state has faced over the last 14 years, is going to allow us to keep our New Hampshire advantage. It's going to allow us to continue to focus on job growth, bring entrepreneurs into the state, um, because we're not um, going to be forced down the road to an income tax. And I think that um, as voters start to debate whether CACR 12 is in the public interest, those two criteria, plus the third thing that's so important is it's going to allow us to do what we have a responsibility to do, provide the best education um, for students in New Hampshire. Those are the three criteria, and I think voters will judge us on that. And with the bipartisan nature of what we have, represented by who's at this table, as well as Governor Lynch's support, I think we're going to have that opportunity to face to every voter in the state of New Hampshire and all 234 towns. I think there's one other comment on this. You need to remember that a year ago, a little more than a year ago, 50% of our towns were going to lose educational funding when the collar came off. And it was, again, a bipartisan group. We put out a new funding mechanism that Representative Foos, Representative Cass and I directly, and Representative Zula directly worked on um, Senator Stiles added on the stipend that we are now giving for reading, where we're having reading issues, and that's been in place for over a year, which absolutely stabilized, and we did not see 50% of our towns lose educational funding aid, which was done before we even got to this. And so it it's, needs to be remembered the steps that we took to stabilize the funding grant and to add on help for people, for students who are not reading well, which has <coughs> passed and in place for over a year. Well, one last thing I want to do is to thank Governor Lynch for working with the Senate President and me to achieve this bipartisan solution. And I would ask that the members of his legislative party have the same courage that he's shown to come forward and support this constitutional amendment which I think all three of us, the President, the Governor, and I recognize as being the best for New Hampshire. Thank you.